who is here for Render Man's talk? Yeah, it, he's legit. The, the sad thing is, is we're covering the exact same thing. So, not at all. Um, I'm Dustin Hoffman. Uh, this is Busting the Bar. So, if you're here for that talk, welcome. I'm Simon Reshchikov, and uh, I was the actual technical guy on the talk. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> That's unkind. <laughs> so, <laughs> my name is Dustin Hoffman. Uh, my parents bet poorly that he wouldn't be known by the time I got of age. Their Enron stocks also didn't work out well. Um, and internet beans, none of those took off. Um, I'm the president and senior, senior engineer for Exigent Systems. We're an IT services firm in Southern California. And um, I hold a private pilot's certificate. It's not a license, in case there's any purists who want to correct me later, uh, since 2008. So <clears throat> this is busting the bar, uh, tracking, air quotes, untrackable private aircraft for fun and profit. Hmm? Okay. You got. Are we gonna? Damn. So yeah. So I'm gonna. I was gonna do the whole thing in haiku, but I thought pictures is better. So <clears throat> Jay Z is serious business. Um, and in case you didn't hear, he got a private jet for Father's Day. So I'm gonna tell my wife that my Father's Day gifts needs to be upgraded for next year. That's One, actually the jet. Like that's this actual Jay Z's jet. And it's a nice jet. And it, not all jets are this nice. But his is this nice. Um, why would someone like Jay-Z use a private plane? Why is general aviation, private aviation useful for someone like him? Well, lots of reasons. <clears throat> First of all, um, it will go like 500 miles an hour. If nothing else, for business people, being able to move around the country at 500 miles an hour on their schedule, as you can imagine, is an incredible advantage. Um, I mean, the man doesn't just write music. Um, he's involved in a number of other business deals. <clears throat> I think he has a bar, or he had one in, in Las Vegas. Um, being able to move around and do deals at 500 miles an hour, incredibly advantageous. It's extremely private and discreet form of travel. If you've never flown privately, I mean, not on a fantastic jet like that. Then you're a loser. <laughs> that was not. <laughs> um, if you've never have, it's really an experience. I mean, I fly a little piston engine, you know, single engine plane. But when I fly into McCarran, I fly in and I go, I don't go to the public terminals with the TSA and the bomb sniffing dogs and the x-ray machine. I go to the executive terminal. Someone welcomes me to Las Vegas, drives me, you know, from the ramp in a little cart over to the, to the marble floored lobby. I mean, they treat me like I'm the president or something. She's one of the cool kids now. I'm working on my cred right now. Um, but needless to say, it's very discreet. Um, there's, uh, and everyone there is trained, you know, to not typically not talk about who comes through. That's kind of part of the expectation in an executive terminal is uh, it's a discreet form of travel. Although if you flag down one of the uh, linemen and give them a 20, they generally don't really care too much. Interesting anecdotes in the Q&A room afterwards. Um, <clears throat> so extremely discreet way to travel, which as you can imagine, someone of a certain level of popularity, for better or for worse, really can't travel um, you know, on Southwest. It's extremely challenging. Um, just, you get mobbed with people, right? Justin Bieber can't fly coach anymore, I imagine. Or first class for that matter. I mean, he's met at, he's mobbed as soon as he gets off the plane. Imagine on the plane. I do have a friend I work out with who uh, was flying Southwest a couple weeks ago out of, out of um, Las Vegas. And um, Little John was on the plane with him. But he was hiding though. I mean, he had his hood, he had a hood pulled down and, and a hat and everything. And, um, and my friend's like, oh, that's Little John. And I'm, like, and I'm thinking to myself, what is Little John doing in coach? But needless to say, he was in coach because Southwest doesn't have anything other than coach. Um, and afterwards, my friend's like, hey, hey, man. Because they're waiting, for their, they're waiting for their luggage. He's like, hey, man. Um, and the guy's like, yeah. He's like, can I have a picture? He's like, make it quick. So, I, you know, I think I'm sure Little John appreciated him not going, oh, it's Little John, and drawing a lot of attention. For someone at the height of their career, under a lot of public scrutiny, being able to slip in and out of cities basically unknown and without having to mingle with the public in any way, needless to, you know, regardless of the fact they may not want to mingle with us, you know, the unwashed masses, uh, that's advantageous. <clears throat> um, likewise with private aviation, you can drop into the hundreds or thousands of small airports that have no commercial service of any kind. Well, the, for example, where I live, the nearest airport with commercial service is about uh, 40 minutes away. The nearest little airport that I could get a private jet into is maybe 10 minutes. So already there's all this time I'm saving. 
And then, most importantly, you can throw really cool parties, and it's like the best bling ever. So, yeah. And two, so even, even if you're not Jay-Z, business people, there's a legitimate business case here. Of course, there's a lot of illegitimate business use too. Planes and boats and second houses or games which people play uh, against the tax system. But he could, you know, with a sales team, you could bring your sales team to three or four sales meetings a day in multiple states and still have them home for their, with their families. Uh, owning a private jet, even in some of the ads, is, is like having a little time machine. Sometimes ads talk just like that. It's like owning a little time machine. Likewise, there's no TSA. Uh, there's no bomb sniffing dogs. There's no tetrahertz x-ray machines. Next slide. And it's really cool. So, <clears throat> Jay-Z's liking this as the story goes on. It's he's, like the early 2000s, let's pretend. So, he's chilling. He's loving it. So, he's taking his private jet out one day in this hypothetical story to uh, a nearby state, because he's having lunch in a nearby state, because when you can move at 500 miles an hour, you can do stuff like that. And then um, he lands, and he gets off his plane, and he gets a text from his lawyer. And the lawyer's like, hey, man, I heard you in the area. You want to have lunch? And Jay-Z's thinking to himself, that's weird. How did he know I was here? The lawyer wasn't omniscient, though many think they are. <laughs> of course, it may not be your lawyer who wanted to find out where you are. Um, it could be a process server, an ex-wife, the IRS, the paparazzi. Lots of people would like to know where these interesting business people, celebrities are. Um, since 1991, the FAA has provided uh, flight plan and aircraft positioning data to organizations that they deem that have a legitimate need to know. It's called the ASDI, or ASDI, the Aircraft Situation Display to Industry. Basically, the ASD is a stream of aircraft positions, including their speed, heading, altitude, flight plan information, um, for every, basically every plane on a flight plan in the United, in the United States' it's national airspace system. With the advent of widespread internet access, sites like FlightAware <clears throat> have appeared, which make use of uh, the ASDI data to provide visualizations of aircraft positions on a map, along with the ability to search for specific information on a plane. Um, this also includes um, long-running history. I think uh, FlightAware has been around for seven years. They save all the data, so they have basically seven years of flight plan information. Yeah, I love it. it says, want a full history of some plane. This is Mark Cuban's plane dating back to 1998. Buy now. Get it within an hour. Yeah, they have millions and millions of records, which they, they indicate on their site very clearly. So how do we reference a specific plane? Well, planes have unique identifiers called tail numbers. Um, every plane has one. It's usually on the tail. They consist of not this one. Yeah, not this one. Sorry, when you have awesome engines like that, it bumps the tail number. Um, it's, uh, in, for all U.S. registered planes, it starts with N. Sometimes it's called the N number, though for planes registered outside the U.S., it starts with some other number. And the mapping from tail number to entity owning it is public. Absolutely. FlightAware provides it too. You mouse over it and it shows you the owner's information. You can find out who, uh, what's the tail number of Rush Limbaugh's plane if you want. It's very secret, as you can tell. In sarcasm. Where's the sarcasm close tag? Uh, the tail numbers are used all over the place. Flight plans, air traffic control, radio communications. They're kind of like the plane's license plate number. Uh, suddenly, with ASDI data more conveniently accessible via websites like FlightAware to the public, uh, privacy provided by private aviation largely vanished. Because remember, ASDI doesn't just provide current positioning for where the plane is. It's hard for the paparazzi to reach you at 35,000 feet on your private plane. Um, they include information on future flights because flight plans are usually uh, filed in advance and they become instantly available in the ASD stream. So what happens is I file a flight plan to, uh, right now for tomorrow morning. That data is immediately available with my proposed uh, departure time and destination and arrival time. I mean, the paparazzi can suddenly get ready or your lawyer or your process server or the guy that wants to repossess your plane, which happens. Apparently, there's, there's people who specialize in this. With the, with the downfall of the uh, real estate market, for a while, like every real estate guy owned a plane. And then they lost, you know, their cash flow dried up uh, with the fall of the housing market. And there was a bunch of people who cropped up who actually go and repossess planes. They like show up. I imagine they're like Dog the Bounty Hunter, but with a pilot's license. That's the way I picture them. Because planes don't have keys, as it turns out, which is weird. Um, if you can get the door open, which requires like a screwdriver, you just like engine start. It's like a Prius, sort of but with turbines. You know how to fly. There's a bunch of airplanes a little, you know, a few miles away you could borrow for a little while. They're all vaguely they come the with same. Their get, they come with their own getaway 
vehicle. I just remind myself, like, down, up, left, right, before every flight. All right. Uh, so, yeah. So, obviously, this didn't really please uh, um, private aircraft wait, people. Wait, wait. I got one more. Okay. FlightAware will send you an email alert for free for any plane you want to sign up for. So, you want to watch somebody who's interesting, you just put in your email address and the planes you want to watch. They'll let you know when they're wheels up, wheels down, when they file the flight plan. So, that's how your filthy attorney knows where you are. So, yeah. So, naturally, when FlightAware became popular in the early 2000s, uh, private aircraft was kind of dissatisfied with this. So, um, there, the, 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 the bar was created. The bar is this list of blocked tail numbers. Um, it's, sorry, sorry. Yeah, the bar is this list of tail numbers that if you're subscribed to the ASDI feed, uh, you're not allowed to publish any information relating to them. So if you type in a uh, tail number uh, that's on the bar into FlightAware, you just won't see anything. Let it's me read you the way they describe it. <clears throat> the bar blocks aircraft movements from public dissemination upon request. Yeah. It was instituted in 2000, just when the internet became popular by the NBAA, which is a lobbying group for the, uh, for, you know, rich people with planes. Rich Peoples has their advocacy groups, like anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, NRA for gun owners, PETA, um, NAMBLA, I guess. There's, there's... <laughs> I'm not saying they're bad guys, though I will say their PR guy was not nice in his yeah. response to us doing this talk. So, yeah. in the uh, Forbes if, article he's quoted, he's not thrilled with us. So, anyway, so the bar is free to sign up for. You don't need any justification to put yourself on it. In 07, uh, the, tried to, the con Congress tried to impose uh, you having to show a valid security concern, but the second that happened, oh, sorry, not 07, 11, um, but the, the second that happened, the NBA tried, began advocacy efforts, and they succeeded, and the, that's still, that provision was repealed. Yeah, they claim they immediately began advocacy efforts on the aircraft owner's behalf. Yeah, so... These guys are hurting right now, friends. If you're, like, Jay-Z, you're probably on the bar. Uh, pretty much everyone is. And Let me so put it to you this way. We have, I have clients with private aircraft. They're not even that interesting. Um, okay, if they hear that, you're super interesting all the time. <laughs> um, but, I mean, they do mundane things, right? But um, they routinely put themselves on the bar. There's no reason not to. It costs nothing. Um, you don't need to demonstrate a valid security concern. You don't have to say that, you know, like, Mexican drug lords are looking to kidnap you or anything. You just go, I want to be blocked, and you're blocked. It's so this ma pe makes people like this happy. Hey, all right. Yeah. So, um, now, it, uh, just if you were here for Enderman's talk, um, he was talking about trying to track people on the bar using ADSB, right? And, well, at least Which possibly is a good idea. do that. And ADSB is awesome, and there's a lot of interesting things you can do with it, as is obvious. But the problem is that there's very, very, very low penetration on private aircraft because, I mean, it's, it's private. Like in your car, you don't have to tell the, the feds about your car's GPS. And so people like uh, private aircraft owners are also very strongly against. Talk, telling everyone about whether they have ADSB installed on their plane or not. Um, let me say this. Let me tell you how much ADSB costs. Whatever it should cost, like times ten. As soon as you put it's for aircraft, oh, everything like yeah. I don't know what the number. What the, what's the fancy word for times ten? Decade, multi, uh, magnitude. Okay. He doesn't know either. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot more than it should cost because it comes with like this yellow paperwork from the FAA that says it's all right for use in aircraft. Yeah, so and, but no one really knows what the penetration is, rate is for private aviation. But I mean, it's really low. Th I don't have to tell anybody that I have a mini disc player in my car. So, and the essential problem is that oh, it doesn't, it's not going to be mandated on private aircraft until 2020. So you can't really track all the interesting people using ADSB. And even by now. 2020, let's be honest. Do you remember the switch to uh, digital television over the air? How many times was that pushed back? I mean, that was relatively cheap, and they were giving away the things for free. And like I said, even uh, the, the NBA has tons of, a lot of power, like the NRA. They're very influential. All right. So we were just kind of, so, yeah, you can't, it seems like it's pretty hard to track people on the bar as of right now. You can go do this, but. Yeah, it, I mean, you, you, you aren't allowed to publicly disseminate their information according to the agreement, you know, if you uh, like are flight aware or something. Now listen to this. It's really hard to hear, isn't it? Crap. That wasn't part of the demo. Demo fail. You gotta click the arrow. Oh, brilliant. I, I told you to get a Mac. 4,600. 
seven mile, six mile, 45 for, and I have that number. So I don't know if you've had listened to any of your traffic control feeds, but that says that this plane was at this place at this time. Um, we, who was the guy's name? Do you remember? Oh, it's owned by some like no name LLC, another game rich people play. Yeah, so sorry. But, but I mean, here I can tell you something about him though, even though um, you know, there's not that much public information. It's a Sky, it's Skyhawk 736 Kilo Delta. It's a single engine piston from 1977. He was at Henderson landing on Wednesday, July 25th at about 10.30 in the morning. Um, which Henderson's just a couple miles south of here for you guys that know the area. Um, we looked him up with just his tail number. If he's here or ever hears about his presentation, it's nothing personal. Yours is just the first yeah. one I came upon. So it turns out that you can download every, every, anything from the internet these days, including like the recordings of every single air traffic control feed ever because aircraft enthusiasts like to be enthusiastic about aircraft. <laughs> My grandpa still listens to the police scanner, so I, I have a friend who weird. would listen to stuff from Live ATC to go to sleep. It's kind of weird. Now you know why controllers go to sleep. It's boring. Yeah, and so there are websites like Live ATC, which so Live ATC as a Friday um, was monitoring 645 airport frequencies, which is almost every single major, cer certainly all the major airports in the Interesting U.S. Interesting ones get monitored. Yeah. So we were sitting there and we're thinking, hey, I have Siri on my phone, like, and I can talk to Siri and he can sort of understand me, and. I mean, I can understand what these ATC guys are talking about, sort of. So why not just use speech recognition to scrape all the tail numbers off of these public feeds? I mean, it's public radio. You're broad broadcasting to the public, so it's totally legal. And why not? I'm a friend. Yes. What? OK. So let me give you a basic uh, introduction to speech recognition. So you have this uh, sound wave. You break it up into little short bits. Then you analyze that, just you take a Fourier transform and then you like look at various interesting points of it. So you get some vectors in like a 13 dimensional space. So you have a sequence of those. So that's cool. We can deal with vectors. We just use linear algebra to make some uh, models. And the models let computers understand language. For the, so for the first job is you have these little things and you have to. Uh, teach your computers to understand what like meaningful sounds are. So you have a phonemes, which is like oh or sh or it. And I thought that's what you rubbed on yourself to make girls like you. Yes. <laughs> so um, you build a hidden Markov model, which is is, is a state machine. Um, I'm hoping people here know what state machines are. And you have a, but it's a state machine where you can't actually observe the state. So. In, in fact, instead, you observe an output that uh, is probabilistically de depends on the actual state. So, you, yeah, it's not that complicated. There's the math for it is really simple and very efficient, which is primarily why people use it. And essentially, the output is what you observe. It's these little 13-dimensional vectors, and the state is what the actual phoneme is. So, and so th this is a common uh, thing they use in artificial intelligence. So the natural, there's a natural. The mathematics behind this lets you ask a very natural question, which is what's the most likely pro tr set of transition probabilities in the state machine giving, given a s particular output, like, you know, a sound file. So that corresponds to training. And another really natural question you can ask using the mathematics behind this is what's uh, the most likely s sequence of s states for, you know, a given state machine given a particular output? And that corresponds to decoding a WAV file into a set of phonemes. Now, so that makes sense. So you can make sounds now. You can sort of understand that. But sound, you have to get the sounds to coalesce into words. So this is what various air traffic control things sound look like. So here on the top you have an, a... What does that even mean? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, some plane. The American 1581 is just a standard commercial flight. And He's talking to Washington Departure. Uh, Washington Department says they basically Washington Departure says to American 15, eight, Flight 1581, <clears throat> radar. He has radar contact confirming that's a required thing that ATC says, um, and he's to climb and maintain 17,000 feet. And on the bottom, you have a private plane. You can see because it starts with November. So this is N uh, six Z W. Oh, sorry, yeah. N six zero W. It's okay. Uh, go talk to the center on this frequency. So. There are a few ways to make language models. One of them is to specify a formal gra grammar like what you do when you're writing a programming language. So there, and you 
generally do that in something like the canals NAR, for, NAR format. So right there is the BNF for uh, BNF because that's a form of grammar in itself. It's like the compiler book. And theoretically, people in air traffic controller are supposed to speak in a formal grammar. However, that doesn't actually happen. There are constant divergences because they're humans and humans As are stupid and they out, don't follow rules. They should be made of computers. Yeah. So you can't really use that. Instead, you can do something else, which is pretty simple. You just get a lot of transcriptions and you get sets of n words. Most of the time you use n equals three because otherwise your graph gets really big. And you say, you know, given the last two words, what's the probability my third word is going to be something? So, and you get files like this. So the slash s is like, that's where the sentence ends. And there, now that's a language model. Because you have uh, some context from words behind previous. And you use this language model to build a graph of your little, uh, your acoustic model things, like your little hidden Markov models for each phoneme. And you, then you simply find the shortest path through the entire graph, and that gets you a sentence. What is it like a weighted thing where each note is weighted? It's a little yeah. more complicated I've been than that. Alright. <laughs> Thank you, it just clicked. So yeah. you, we used our CM, so <coughs> this, we thought this was totally plausible, so we used our Carnegie Mellon Sphinx uh, rec speech recognition software. It's a uh, state of the art. It is probably better than your Google phones. Yeah, it's probably better than your Android phone's speech recognition. Um, it's unfortunately also academic software, which means it's sometimes difficult to work with and has lots of ac uh, undocumented features and has spent a bunch of time talking to the grad students who worked on it to figure out, you know, how to do some very obvious things. Then we bought a corpus of air traffic control data. It turns out that in the 90s, the DARPA tried to automate air traffic control because, you know, it's expensive and computers were cool back then. Or at least the transcribing. It would be very useful to have complete transcripts of all ATC recordings. Yeah. Um, they're, they're kept indefinitely by the FAA for liability purposes. Um, so, and to have it automatically, I mean, transcription sucks. I mean, anybody who, I mean, look at doctor's offices. They spend a ton on transcription. And they've tried to automate it for ages. In the 90s, it sure didn't work. Yeah. So uh, back then, BBN Technologies made a giant corpus of uh, various recordings from several airports. Like and 70 they hours. Describe them well. And so they failed at their task back then because they had a slightly harder problem, which was that they had even shittier computers and they were trying to completely understand what was going on um, rather than just pick out tail numbers. Yeah, they wanted, they wanted all the words accurate. Yeah, the, that... not just all the words accurate. They wanted to actually be able to, like, automate the. Um, the positioning of the planes, or the, the routing, based purely on the, uh, uh, just purely by speech recognition. And, and that a, didn't work out very well. And there's a bunch of things that don't even, there aren't even words in uh, use in use by the FAA. Waypoints and stuff that are just have, uh, yeah. like random letters that we pronounce. Like so with us, the, we had uh, slightly different issues. It was had a simple problem because we don't need to quite recognize, as, re recognize quite as much, but it still was a shitty signal and computers are still kind of slow. And uh, so with us, we, ha we wanted to make our system scale to many airports, so that's a problem because different airports have different landmarks which, corresponds to, which correspond to slightly different language models. And we also had uh, transcripts that, you know, from this uh, corpus, and a lot of them did suck. So we had to kind of filter for that. I don't feel like I got what I paid for with that, really. Yeah, so we uh, we'd also, so we used uh, about 50 tr personally transcribed utterances from every individual airport we added to our system to, to adapt an existing acoustic model uh, to, to the characteristics of that particular, the recordings from that particular airport. Uh, we used both, if you're a speech recognition expert, here are some buzzwords that should mean something to you. I can't really explain all the math behind this too, this fast. Um, so we used, uh, we, uh, I have ATC provides uh, 16 kilohertz clips, uh, 16 kilohertz uh, audio files, but all those high frequencies and radio actually are just pretty much noise, and certainly you can't pick out how the, the little bits that people use of those frequencies. As a pilot, the, it's hard. Um, yeah. Even to hear it, even for me in the cockpit, um, it's a challenge to understand what's said every time. So we just downsampled everything and traded an 8 kilohertz model. Uh, and so, yeah, and that worked pretty well. If you want to, us to add an airport, you should send us like five minutes of a transcribed speech. And we trained a and from this, we got 70% word accuracy based on some tests. 
So that doesn't sound very high, but that's pretty good because this, uh, things like per airport landmarks were much lower because they're different and you know, that's, not, that's obviously not going to be recognized very well. Things like numbers and the NATO alphabet, which conveniently are what tail numbers are made of, was the recognition and accuracy for that is higher because it's the same everywhere and there's a lot of training data for it. So that's not too bad. You also, we also found that since, you know, people say their tail numbers like a hundred times, well not hundred, but over the course of arriving to an airport, uh, certainly more than three They're times. They're going to identify themselves many times, so uh, requisitely. It's actually required um, before every radio transmit. Yeah, you because of that, you're yourself. almost certainly going to catch the airplane as it goes in, um, because um, there's, you know, some variation in speech recognition. It's not going to work every time because it's a hard signals processing problem. But you're, so you're almost certainly going to get all the airplanes that come in, but you're also going to get a bunch of false negatives. So, sorry, a bunch of false positives because whenever it recognizes something the wrong way. So in the future, um, we are going to look at uh, nearby utterance, nearby extracted tail numbers and then uh, correlate them and then things that sound similar, you, if there's, you know, a bunch of ones of one thing and another one that sounds similar that is something else, you could probably guess that that was just a mistake in the uh, transcription. So essentially you can use the temporal like processes to do this. You can also, we can also improve the language models. There's, you know, n-gram models are kind of vague and not very specific. So that's a thing. And we can also drastically improve the sign signals processing. Signals processing is kind of black magic, at least within certain like fields. But uh, as you can see, so just, you know, remove, just doing a low pass filter would for us improve recognition accuracy from like 4% to like 40, just that. So that was cool. Um, so there's certainly a lot more, a, a number of further improvements you can use. And finally, as a, so this isn't on here, but as a plane flies in, you, you, you can actually just look at, uh, you know, so it has to contact several different waypoints. Like it has to talk to one group of people and then a different group of people, and you can use that path to help infer when you're having a mistake and when you're not. Once we were to process more than let's say the week's worth of data that we have in there now, which the process is extremely fast, it's just a matter of doing it, um, you could actually track them as they move across the country. So even though they're completely blocked and they aren't, you know, publicly disseminated otherwise, you could actually track them as they cross the country, not just in what are called terminal areas where they're going to land or take off. Yeah, so this is, method is inherently somewhat imperfect because, well, let's listen to this other clip. I don't think anyone has any idea what this guy is saying. Like, it's just gibberish, I'm not even joking. He's, I don't know how these air traffic control guys And I know do. that guy. No, I actually want to listen to it again because it's just hilarious. Sorry. I admit it sounds way worse here than it did in our hotel room, so that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And that was at McCarran, so you can imagine the controller going freaking out right now trying to figure out what this pilot's doing. So, yeah. So you're never going to get perfect recognition accuracy with something like this, but although you can, in fact, track a bunch of flights. Uh, we have a website, openbar.net. Uh, it's not yet public, although there are some sample transcripts and, you know, us actually pulling out plane numbers. Because uh, we were hacking at it until last night, let me be real honest. Yeah. But, and so pretty much the reason it's not public is because, like, we haven't written the search engine for, you know, checking for you. 1, 4, and 14, and yeah, 0, and 0. It's a bunch of bull crap. There's a book that prescribes how everybody's supposed to talk in the radio. No one's using it. Yeah. So apparently there's a lot of permutations for the way you could say numbers. And um, it's a little frustrating to me. Yeah, I have but to admit, when I started searching through like the thousands of records and I wasn't getting any, I was freaking out a little bit. But yeah, we can in fact, uh, we have all the transcripts just sitting on our server and we'll here, be I can show you up to I the public pretty soon. Here. Oh, here, okay. Battle. Careful. Watch out. Cord coming through. Thank you. Buttons to push. Hold on. What is this? What does that even mean? Here we are. This I know. There's nothing on this computer. Oh, including internets, apparently. Oh, God. Hold on. Wait, what? You Wait. turned on Wi-Fi. What's wrong with you? I don't have the more GBs, man. Hold on. You talk for a minute. 
All right, I don't know what you're trying to do. Anyway. I was going to get on the internet. I'll figure it out. Yes? You're Oh yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about next. So, yeah, so, so yeah, this is what I don't know what Dustin is trying to do, but I'm just going to continue talking. I was going to go on the internet and show him the site. So, uh, does anyone here want to find out how you can track all the planes yourself with really, really high recognition accuracy in the United States? If you don't, oh yeah, that's the, the right answer is naturally no. But in fact, the FAA, that the whole um, that oh, ASDI feed, jobs. it is you can sign up for it yourself. Now it used to cost money; you used to like have to provide your own line. But now uh, there's a just uh, an e you can search for ASDI feed, and, you know, a and there's a page on the FAA website. You have to send an email. We've sent this email. Um, Hold on, I have a slide for that. Anyway, so. What you can do, you send this email, they reply you with this really nice thing saying, oh yeah, all you need to do is just set up this, you know, I've, yeah, there we are. This is what you need, this, these are the technical requirements for tracking <coughs> all the planes. Um, you have to send an email, you have to have a really, really, really big bandwidth, because this is like big for, you know, the early 90s. You have to know how to parse XML and set up a secure VPN. And you have to sign some forms that say that anyone who's on the bar, you can't disseminate that information. Uh, um, but that doesn't stop you naturally from disseminating, say, say, internally within your company or acting on it. And you can find out every, what everything's going on. Yeah, this Press next. Frankly, next page down space. So that's what the uh, the feed looks like. It's just super easy. Um, if there are two versions, there's one where you can find out uh, things five minutes later. Like there's a little delay. And that way you can't get, like, there's an auditing process that might occasionally come ac across you if you want live data. But instead, if you're okay with, you know, flight plan data five minutes later than real, which is totally okay if you're, like, TMZ and trying to get Jay-Z. Because remember, uh, you'll, get, <coughs> you'll get the flight plan the day ahead of You don't ever have to be audited. So seriously, everyone in this room should do this. Just <laughs> if you, no, you just can. <coughs> yeah, you can't tell <coughs> anyone else about what you see there but you can track every plane. You know, can now find out exactly where Rush Limbaugh is flying. So this is really nice. Um, I, NPR thought it was a good idea. Yeah, but it also is not that great because it means that there's, you know, this whole bar thing. This, uh, a lot, there are a lot of private aircraft owners that think that their flights are private. In fact, they're not. There are a bunch of people doing this. There, the FAA has a list of the people subscribed to the SDI feeds, and there's 64 groups. Actually, However, it wasn't even 64 groups. It was like several groups were named like multiple times with multiple people. Yeah. So it might be like 30, 30 yeah. groups are named as having subscribed. That doesn't sound that bad. However, if, if you look at the forms that you have to sign to get a, a copy of the ASDI feed, you can opt out of being on this list. So, and we, you know, we sent our email. And I'm signing up. As of Friday, there were 30 subscribers on the wait queue to be connected, um, which means that that kind of very strongly implies that the number of total people subscribed is much, much, much larger than 64. So there's a few uses for this. Um, one, you know, you can track every person, every interesting person ever, or not quite, but, you know, find out who Rush Limbaugh is cheating on now. Um, and you can even say, you know, you can go to that airport and interview the person. You just can't say that you got, you found out where they got, how they got there from the flight plan. Uh, also, if you like have a company with like a competitor or something, and the, you know There's you have a, a sufficient those. scale that the competitor owns a private plane, this might be a useful thing for you to do. People, people, this is very interesting uh, for companies already now. For example, retailers are compete very strongly to get their I don't know tube of toothpaste on uh, get get shelf space at Walmart. Well, if your competitor that also makes toothpaste is flying into Bentonville, Arkansas, you might want to know that. Because private planes cost thousands of dollars an hour to operate. Well, if your competitor is putting a plane in there, and the only thing in Bentonville is like the Walmart headquarters, it's probably like the it's probably the entire town. I've never been there, but um, you're only going to put your C-level executives or senior salespeople on there. 
the only people you're going to pay thousands of dollars an hour to fly around that way and for the flight crew and everything else is going to be someone important. You can at least derive or guess at important things happening where private jets are going. Yeah, and, fin and finally, you know I mean, if you don't run a company or anything, you could just do this just because it's interesting. And you can't tell any of your friends about, you know, wh who you found out is flying where, but that's okay because you can still find out where all the interesting people are flying. Um, yeah, and it's really easy. Like, actually, you should just Google it and do it. You could probably have a connection before the end of the week. Right, so you could, you could yeah, Jay-Z has a sad now, um, I'm assuming. <clears throat> There's no reason someone like TMZ, if they haven't already done it, they're idiots. Um, what, you know, if, honestly, I, I, I imagine they pay people for tips now. That's typically how these things work. Yeah. Um, they don't need to pay anyone for a tip. They can just get a feed of all these things themselves. And they can have a list of everybody. Um, and they can know the day before. Heck, they can let the reporter guy sleep in because he doesn't have to be there until just before the plane pulls up. Um, but, yeah. Or ProPublica can, uh, you know, have uh, someone waiting for Sheldon Adelson, uh, the owner of, San, you know, the head of Sands Corp, you know, to complain about his donations to the Koch brothers or whatever. I mean, you could just imagine the chaos that's going to ensue with this. Yeah. So this is also kind of unfortunate because it means that private airplane privacy is just not a thing. At least not a thing if, you know, if, if someone wants to track you, they trivially can. Uh, if they don't even want to, you know, send an email and write a parser and set up a VPN, they are just going to probably be able to use Open Bar, at least to, like, within fairly decent accuracy. It's never going to be perfect, but it'll get pretty close. And that's unfortunate because we like privacy. And it was kind of conflicting to, you know, tell everyone that it doesn't really exist anymore. But it's more important to know that if you're being tracked. Wouldn't yeah. you rather know? Yeah, I'd rather know. And think that, you're, that you have a, a, some semblance of privacy? And I think, you know, even for the people who I'm going to get flack from, who are already unhappy with me at the moment, um, that's really what it was, is they thought they had something they just never had. I mean, you don't move multi-million dollar assets through the air uh, into public airports. And, and really, did you think? And talking on public airwaves with radios that are like from the 1940s, did, were, they, were, they were under a really a bad false impression. I mean, ADSB just make the problem worse, along with all the other numerous problems. I don't know that anyone actually just touched on the privacy issue. On, I'll be honest, scraping this god-awful um, audio is hard. The ASD and ADSB is easy. Um, uh, you know, that's completely automated. It's like a SQL select. I get the tail number right in the field. I don't have to scrape it out and <laughs> figure out if they said 1-1 one, one or 11 or 11 Zs. So, yeah. Um, you guys should go have fun because this whole airplane privacy thing, like, just doesn't exist at this point. Um, you might have more privacy on Southwest. Yeah. If you pull, like, a hood down and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so this, I just wanted to say one more thing, going back to RenderMan's talk. So it's actually even worse than he kind of, the situation is worse than how he presented. We kind of emailed uh, beforehand. And he, meant, he said that, you know, there are preventive measures you can take from the sorts of destroy, you know, crash the London 2012 Olympics by spoofing a billion planes. Oh, crap. You're going you're gonna to scoop NPR. <laughs> they're going to no, no. hate on you. Um, because, of, and he said, you know, you could turn on, you could keep primary radar on and make sure that there's a backup system. You could fall back to but radar. The problem with that is that you actually can't because... Uh, the point of ADS-B is to have a closer separation between planes, and it, the, the reason like you need ASB to do that is because humans plus radar cannot handle that sort of separation. Radar is not so good. So there's like there's no point. There's just no. There's, there's it's good to have a backup system, but transitioning between a system that heavily relies on ADS-B and a backup system is going to be almost completely impossible. It's like Google saying, "Oh well, if our cable connection goes, if our you know." A hardware cable goes down, like, we'll just use a modem. Yeah, because once you have that many planes in the system that depend on the, basically the bandwidth that ADSB offers, basically closer separation, ADSB, which is completely relies on a GPS, which is incredibly accurate, versus radar, which isn't. Um, nor is there, like, anywhere near 100% radar coverage in the United States. Sorry if you're flying home later. Um, 
you can't just fall back to radar when you have thousands of bogus signals up there. There's no way to know quickly um, or to get everyone else out of the way. Your, your, your system is now dependent on this additional bandwidth. I mean, it's like, you know, you make more money, but then you start spending more. You're really dependent on that, yep. that income now. You can't just fall back to your old income level when the economy starts to stink. So, yeah, that's... So it's bad, friends. It's real bad. There's no hope. And there's no way to fix it. <laughs> Yeah, and there's no way to fix it, like, quickly, because, you know, they've spent several billion dollars doing this, and you have to physically move things onto planes to change these systems. These little boxes, you, so they don't get Windows updates. So there is actually no hope for any of this. No, All the right? reporter... So there's no more... There, there's, no, there's no airplane privacy, and also the entire system is... Like, you either have... You know, either as, we can't just have more planes because the systems are almost full as they are now, or if we do implement this new system and have more planes, it's going to crash horribly and like act, stop the world. Some, someone's going to do it and like hit five, five hub cities and with a billion fake ADSB planes and with like stop one the entire software radio. Uh, plane ecosystem for a well, few days. You know, I compare it to people I used to work with who are like, I got a raise and I'm going to start spending more money. I mean, it's like that. It's so, yeah, we're screwed. Have fun. Thank you.